and minimalists. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I'm Ryan Nicodemus. And together, we are the Minimalists. You know, today we're going to talk about questioning. We're going to talk about questioning religion. We're going to talk about questioning atheism. We're going to talk about questioning belief systems. We're going to talk about finding peace mm. with today's guest, Erwin McManus, who is the founder of Mosaic, which is right across the street from here. Very convenient, right? <laughs> Erwin, thank you for being here today. Yeah, I'm so glad to be here to travel all this way. <laughs> <laughs> the whole block. <laughs> now, er Erwin is the author of 12 books, including the new book, uh, The Way of the Warrior. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can see it right here. And uh, there's so much that we want to talk to you about today. I want to dive deep into the book. I want to answer some audience questions that we have, but I thought we could probably start, well, at the beginning. The beginning <laughs> is often a good place to start. You actually start your book with, with an amazing line. I want to read a little bit from the first page here. Uh, the warrior is not ready for battle until they have come to know peace. For all the wars that have ever been waged from the beginning of time, we're first born in a person's heart. We have a history of war because our souls are at war. We have conflicts because our hearts are conflicted. God, I love that line. Yeah. We have conflict because our hearts are conflicted. One more line here. Every war, every conflict, every act of violence exists because our souls rage. Now, just earlier this month, there was a mass shooting in Ryan's and my hometown. We're from Dayton, Ohio. And uh, two blocks from the last house I lived in, in, in Dayton, Ohio, um, nine people were murdered and uh, another 27 people injured. And this, when I read this line, it reminded me of that. There, there was a war sort of going on inside. Why, why are we, what's going on inside us? Yeah, one of the things that's really confounded me, by the way, it's great to be here with you guys, <laughs> is that humans are an incredible species. I mean, we're, we're the only species that ever harnessed fire and electricity. Mm. I mean, we're the only species that invents the uh, internet, invents the cell phone, invents pizza. And uh, Thank God for pizza. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and with, uh, I mean, we can figure out how to explore the oceans and leave the atmosphere, and we cannot figure out how to create peace. Mm. And so how is it possible that we can be so inventive, so creative, so extraordinary as a species, and yet... Uh, this thing that we all desperately need and long for, we seem incapable of creating. And not only that, but every environment we think would eliminate violence actually seems to almost perpetuate it. We live in a society with so much freedom, so much opportunity. Uh, we, we're, we're not, um, for most Americans, there's not massive oppression. But there is something in the environment that we create that creates an internal volatility. And, and so some of it, I think, is that we have to take some time and, and ask the essential questions. What is it that the human soul needs? Whether you believe in, in uh, a transcendent uh, um, reality, whether you believe that we're created by God or not, there's something about the way humans are designed that can uh, move us to what we would call inhumanity. And I think it's kind of odd because if you look at a, a killer whale eat a seal and play with it before it eats it, or a tiger chase down a, a gazelle, we never think it's an animal. We never think it's outside of its nature. Oh, mm. yeah. But with humans, we can look at an act and think to ourselves that act in Dayton was inhumane. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. And that. But you wouldn't say a lion was in, in that, lion. Yeah, in lion. <laughs> <laughs> and so that, that tells sense, me right. whether you believe in God or not, you actually have this um, transcendent sense of a higher essence of humanity, mm. that we're somehow beneath our intention. Because mm. you cannot do something that's inhumane if it's actually our intention if it's our design. Mm. It's even like thinking about things being unnatural. My wife's from the mountains of North Carolina. She grew up on a farm. I'm kind of a, I, I'm, I'm a city rat. I mean, it's, uh, that's why I've been all my life. You know, I'm from San Salvador and then lived in Queens and I lived in Miami and, and, I, and I live in LA and I, I love cities. And, and one day we were traveling through Arkansas or somewhere in, in, the, in the middle of the country and it's all the same to me. <laughs> and, uh, and we were quiet and I, there were all these trees and all this wilderness. And, and I broke the silence by saying, look at all this undeveloped land. Mm -hmm. And my wife, <laughs> she went off the roof. She was like, this is not undeveloped land. These are trees. These are trees. God created trees. And, mm -hmm. and I looked at her and I said, honey, if there is no God, cities are just our honeycombs. Mm. There are colonies. 
when you think of cities as being outside of nature, you actually think of humans being outside of um, creation, mm. that somehow there's something transcendent about humans. And so if we're nothing but a, an advanced version of all the species on this planet, if there is nothing uh, divine, nothing transcendent, you cannot say cities are not natural. Mm. Yeah. We're in the middle of a colony right now, yeah. of a comb, and just like silkworms create silk, humans create futures. Mm. That's beautiful. I, so, so the reason that I, I wanted to talk to you today, um, and our, our good friend uh, Lewis Howes connected us. Thank, thanks to, to Lewis for, for making that happen. And when you and I talked on the phone, I, it was shortly after I had a, a meeting with a guy named Eric Weinstein. He is a mathematician. He, is, uh, he works at, at uh, Teal Capital. And one thing that fascinated me about him is he is an atheist, mm -hmm. but he goes to synagogue every weekend. <laughs> And I, I, I'm, it reminded me of something I heard about you because I know about Mosaic. It's right across the street from, from here. And I walk past it all the time. And I, I see it's very vibrant, especially on Sundays. They take up the parking in our garage here uh, <laughs> <laughs> because you have so many people there. But I heard you say that you know, you're a church that has an extraordinary uh, number of, of atheists. You have and not just atheists, but people with different beliefs. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that's the one thing that Ryan and I really... Uh, we appreciate about each other. Ryan and I have tend to have similar values, but we have <laughs> radically different beliefs. <laughs> and I thought to myself, how could this guy, Eric, not be a believer, but also go to effectively church every weekend? And, mm -hmm. and the answer came to me because I realized like, oh, it's not just that. It's, there's a sense of community that's mm -hmm. happening there that you probably don't get elsewhere. Well, I think it's Alan de Baton that uh, I heard years ago at TED and he, he's an atheist who advocates for religion. Mm. And he thinks that atheists should have churches. And, and, and I thought, so interesting, here's an atheist who's for religion, and I'm a Christian who's against religion. <laughs> and he doesn't believe in God, and he wants religion. And I believe in God, and I don't want religion. Mm. In fact, if anything, I've probably created a great deal of controversy in my life by um, being so anti-religion. And years and years ago, um, I, I, I think I was um, really despised for a statement that I was uh, held accountable for that the greatest enemy to the movement of Jesus is Christianity. Mm. And the problem is that I actually did say it. And yeah. so <laughs> I've been misquoted a lot in my life, but I actually did say that, yeah. so I had to, and, and I do That's believe powerful. that. Uh, and, and so people come, yes, because when I, I didn't grow up in, in any kind of really organized religion, any kind of faith. I certainly didn't grow up anywhere near Christianity in that sense. And um, my, my, my mom brought a Buddha home. We were Buddhists at a very early age. And then, and then she moved toward Judaism when we became more Jewish. And, and uh, my, um, my grandfather took me to a place where he said a nine-year-old boy died and he was reincarnated and that became my grandfather. So my grandfather was an atheist who believed in reincarnation. Mm. And because Buddhism is atheistic and a lot of people are unaware of that, you, you know. They, mm. and, uh, and then my grandmother's Roman Catholic, but she never went to mass. So, because <laughs> she had no trust for any institutions and no pre, and so she would never get it, put us near a priest. And so I grew up in that kind of environment. And I think my, my real father was Jewish. And, uh, and so you have all this combination of belief systems and one of the things that really struck me is that um, a lot of times we try to focus on faith connecting us to God, but really the most tangible thing it does is connect us to each other. Mm. And it gives us, um, hopefully not, it, it, it becomes the worst of religions when it gives us rules on how to relate to each other. Yeah. It becomes the best of spirituality when it gives us values for relating to each other. Yeah. yeah. We're going to talk about some of those values. I want to talk about service and contribution, a bunch of other stuff, but we do have some questions here from our audience, so let's dive into those. Our, our first question today is from Jonathan in Waco, Texas. Mainly, I'm, I'm curious about bringing minimalism into communities of faith or church groups, um, kind of small group sessions and things like that. Um, have you had any experience in that in, in an actual church or a religious setting? Um, and I'd, I'd love to hear from you know those experiences or any of the experiences of your listeners. Uh, I feel like definitely a lot of the a lot of the, the tenets of minimalism are, are certainly compatible in that arena. Um, just not sure how to go about implementing it. I love this question from Jonathan because how often do people come up to us and they're like, you know, Josh and Ryan, 
you are doing the work of Jesus Christ. And then kind of give us a wink. <laughs> uh-huh. And then someone will come up to us and they'll say, you know what, you guys, you are doing the work of the Buddha. And we really, really appreciate that. And it's funny because when I think about minimalism, that is the one thing I feel like every religion has in common, every major religion. I, I grew up a uh, Jehovah's Witness, mm. which is, uh, uh, you know, a Christian kind of based religion, a um, little bit more hardcore than most Christian religions. But but I grew up, I grew up Christian and I really appreciated the values I took away from that. I mean, I wouldn't be who I am today if I didn't grow up in that organization. I am not advocating for that organization. I have, I'm no part of that organization anymore. But what I do appreciate are the lessons that I learned. And I think that minimalism is one of those things that uh, I looked at and I was like, oh, here's, some, here's a set of values that I can really take from. And uh, I can apply these to my life without having to have a, you know, a, de- a defiant or, or, or I'm sorry, a definite name of this religion that I'm practicing. So I'm, I'm with you, Erwin. Like I am, I'm not anti-religious in the sense that I think religion is by and far, you know, more harm than it is good. I think it actually is probably more good than it is harm. Um, but I certainly want to avoid any divisiveness. And I think that's what religion creates a lot now, whether it's, you know, if you, if you have a, a really devout Jewish person in the room, a really devout Christian in the room, a really devout Buddhist in the room, a really devout uh, Muslim in the room, they are all going to, and, and they're, you know, if they're really truly practicing the religion, they're all going to be kind to each other, but inside they're, they're all thinking, well, I have the right religion. And that still to me is a, is a bit divisive, but, but minimalism, Jonathan, answer to your question. Yes. Like minimalism, I think it can be applied to, uh, it can be brought into churches it can be uh, it can be brought to atheists, um, but yeah, I think when you look at Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad, uh, C- Confucius, um, they all have the same thing in common, and they all give that that same advice of like live a simple life. I think I think ultimately, Erwin, we're talking about intentionality here, right? And that's what you talk about, in, in a lot of your work is intentionality. Mm-hmm. And I pulled this from your website. You have your core values that are that are listed there. Um, can we talk a little bit about those values? Because you, you share them openly, uh, obviously. And, <laughs> and, and I saw them and like I was like, wait a minute, number five here is creativity is the natural result of spirituality. Um, and I heard you discuss this with your son. You have a podcast that you do with, with Aaron <laughs> um, called Battle Ready. Who and usually disagrees with me about everything. <laughs> <laughs> it's like me and Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> it's really good. Um, but can we, can we talk about that? Because I don't make that natural leap right away. Creativity is the natural result of, of spirituality. Can we talk about that a little bit? Yeah. When I first um, penned those words, I did not have any adherence. <laughs> and in fact, I had an incredible amount of opposition both from the world of faith and, and the, the secular world. And there would be um, from Jordan Peterson, who would disagree mm. dramatically, right. uh, to probably the most popular pastors in, in the world who would disagree. And so I think it's interesting, a lot of atheists and Christians actually agree on this, that humans are not creative. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and they teamed up to disagree with you. Yes. And, and, and ironically, um, uh, the, the the deterministic framework for scientific determinism uh, believes that creativity is an illusion, that it does not exist, that everything is mathematical, mm. uh, that everything is cause and effect. Mm. And, uh, and at the national conference about 10 years ago on scientific determinism, they said that free will, creativity, and spirituality uh, do not exist, that they're um, illusions on, in a universe completely determined by math. Mm. And I thought it's really fascinating because Growing up, I would have thought atheists would be for creativity, and Christians were clearly against it. Mm. <laughs> and, and religion seemed to be against it. Mm. To me, religion was about conformity, um, about uh, control, about shaping people through guilt and shame, mm-hmm. and limiting human uniqueness and human creativity, yeah. which uh, made me opposed to those kinds of movements. Mm. And now it's been a huge shift. And, and I've been a small part of that shift. Um, but atheism now believes that creativity is um, an illusion. Mm. And I, I actually think that um, it's a part of the human structure that h- humans can actually materialize the invisible. That what humans can do different than any other species, and some of it is because being a part of the TED community for 20 years, everyone advocates for some species. 
And I, I kept, I, I'd, I would go home, home to my wife and tell her, I need a species, you know, because <laughs> everyone has one. And then I realized I've been studying humans all my life. And, <laughs> and uh, people think I've been studying God all my life. I've not been studying God all my life. I've been studying humans <laughs> all my life. And, and one of the things that makes this really distinct is in the, way, in the way that bees create hives and ants create colonies, humans create futures, mm. that we don't even think about it. It happens so naturally that we choose and it catalyzes the future. And we choose and it eliminates the future. And, and I, I think this is the part of the creative essence of being human, that humans are imagined to imagine and created to create. And, and I, that's why in an earlier book called Artists and Soul, I talk about how humans are both a work of art and artists at work, that humans can imagine something. And so even though I know the theme of this is being minimalist, I actually, I would say that for me, the, the, my driving intention is to convince people they're generative, mm. that humans can actually create. And if you create by accident, you may create what you regret. Mm. And so there has to be an intentionality around your actions so that you can create a better humanity. Right now, we're living inside of someone's imagination. And for me, one of the best examples of that is when Barack Obama took the oath of office and became president of the United States. So no matter what your political position is, he was walking inside of the dream of Elma K. Jr. who said, I have a dream. Mm -hmm. one, man, one day, we will not be measured by the color of our skin, by the content of our character. And I'm going, Barack Obama is literally walking inside of the imagination of MLK. Mm. And even though our imaginations are imperfect, we're sitting in a room right now that was imagined by Jefferson and imagined by Washington, imagined by Adams. We're sitting in a nation that's closer to what was imagined by Lincoln. And every time people who intend good uh, live passive lives, those who have malice um, have more intentionality in creating what's in their imagination. Hmm. And so Hitler imagined the world and violently tried to impose it on humanity. Mm -hmm. And today, and this is what frustrates me about, about faith, hmm. is that I, would, I stepped into Christianity and it was always this passive, almost victimized perspective about the future. God, do something. God, do something. God, do something. And I kept hearing this narrative going, wait a minute. People who do not believe in God do not wait for permission to create the future they imagine. But you're sitting around imagining that God's going to do something mm. if you just ask him. Mm. And you need to actually realize that you are, if you believe in God, then you have to believe you're created to create. And mm. that we are the instruments from which the future emerges. And, and regardless That's, of your beliefs, you need to intervene in your own life is essentially what you're saying there, as opposed to waiting for someone else to, to intervene. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I'm an immigrant from El Salvador. I was born yeah. in San Salvador. And, and and we live in a very dangerous city, so we spent very little time outside. So from the age of three, I was playing chess. That was that was my sport. Mm. <laughs> you know? and, and my grandfather, I uh, was very competitive. He would checkmate me in six moves, you know, five moves, seven moves, eight moves, whatever. And I would cry because I was, you know, five. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I would say, "Let me move." And he would always tell me, "When you earn a move, you can have a move." Mm. And he taught me very early on in my life that. Um, my future would expand by the wisdom of my choices. Mm. And, and my future would be eliminated by the foolishness of my choices. Mm. And, and I think a lot of times people of faith try to um, maintain a superstitious view of how reality happens. And, and, you know, and so there's a part of me that, um, I, I'm a person who has deep faith, but I'm really a person who lives in the reality of, of life. I love that. And I think it's important. Yeah. I, I, I wish that most religious people had that attitude because I have an issue with faith too, with the extent of, you know, you think about what's going on with our environment. Yeah. I'm not even talking about global warming. I'm not even talking about, you know, climate change. I'm just talking about if you look at, you know, 50% of the rainforest gone, 90% of monarch butter, butterflies gone, our streams being polluted, all of these things. I was raised to not worry about it. I was raised to, <laughs> to, 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 to believe that one day someone with Jesus was going to come back and he was going to correct all of our mistakes. And whether that happens or not, that, that narrative doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. It's like, it would be like, because, you know, God made us in his image. It would be like, uh, you know, if a parent never had the child to clean up their own room mm -hmm. and just always consolidated everything for that child to the point where the child didn't know how to do anything. So I totally agree. Like we, we do have to take some responsibility for what our actions are, but faith, uh, sometimes, um, 
I think it can really, it can stilt our development almost. Yeah, it's almost as if the narrative was, you can live in the sewer because one day Jesus is gonna come and clean it up. Right. And before I ever believed anything about Jesus, I had a value for the environment. Mm. And I couldn't understand how people who, who actually had a, a worldview that we've been entrusted with creation would have a lower view for caring for creation than the person who didn't even know God. Yeah. You know, so, I, mean, I drive an electric car, mm. and a part of that is because I can. Mm. I mean, I know a lot of people can't afford one, yeah. and a lot of people cannot, but I, I feel like for me, I have an opportunity to have zero carbon you know, footprint on this planet when I drive. Yeah. And I feel like that's a part of, ironically, it's, it's almost like reverse minimalism. <laughs> you know, I, I spent more money so that I could have less impact. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think you have to ask the question, what can you do? But I, I, I just, I love this planet. Mm -hmm. I don't understand how you could believe in God and believe God created this planet and then not love this planet. Yeah. And want to take care of the water and the, you know, the atmosphere. And, yeah. and that doesn't make any sense to me at all. Yeah, me when either. We, when we talk about what it means to live a meaningful life, ultimately we're, we're often talking about it means aligning your actions with your values. And what you're talking about there is you, you've aligned an action with your values. You, you, you've been intentional with that decision that you've made. Now, uh, also, you have the resources to be able to afford that. And I think that's great. Um, Jonathan, I'm going to send you a copy of Irwin's book. Uh, the Way of the Warrior. I'm also going to send you a copy of our book, our first book, Minimalism, Live a Meaningful Life, because in there we talk about the five fundamental or foundational values in our own lives, um, health, relationships, creativity, growth, and contribution. I think you'll find value in that. So, Sean, if you, could, if you could reach out to Jonathan, send him a copy of The Way of the Warrior. Also, send him a copy of minimalism if you like our uh, podcast you'll like the audiobook version of that or if you want the book book or the ebook version we're happy to send you those as well ryan what time is it you know what time it is it is time for our lightning round where we answer questions from social media indeed we do so uh erwin we are at the minimalists on twitter facebook and instagram you are at erwin mcmanus on on all the relevant platforms <laughs> uh, and and we, we follow you over there and um uh, so what we try to do during this lightning round is we answer folks' questions with a, a short shareable, less than 140 character response. All right. We don't actually have to do that. We just ramble on a bit. Sean makes it look really pretty <laughs> in, in the show notes. He, he copies out, tweezes our answers out, posts them in the show notes uh, so people can share our pithy answers on social media. Ryan, what's our first question? Our first question is from Joshua Hook. To what extent is faith compatible with doubt? So, Erwin, you, I know you talk about this, you know, doubt and, and, and faith and, and um, how they are, well, they are compatible in a way. They're not just compatible, they're essential. Mm. Without doubt, there is no faith. Mm. There's just belief. Look at that. He's, he's being pithy. Dude, that was awesome. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, well, let me, let me uh, expand on, on my thoughts on this really quickly. My, my pithy answer is we must question what we hold close, otherwise we cling to everything and and I think that um, if we've been sold something if we've been told something since we were young and then we refuse to question it then how how strong is our conviction really right if, if, if we're just given some template and then we're told not to question it then I think we're gonna have a really weak faith in whatever it is is yeah. that fair yeah, absolutely I, I, I think a person doesn't doubt doesn't think Mm. He's giving you all these oh gems, Oh my goodness, Sean. man. This is, <laughs> that's great. Uh, Ryan, what you got for us? My pithy answer is faith and doubt are two sides of the same coin. It's funny because when I read this question, I almost didn't really understand it because I'm like, what does doubt have to do with faith? But then I realized like doubt and faith, it really is this, uh, at least the way I take it, is it's this feeling that I get. It's going with my gut. And a lot of the times... I forget what you mentioned in your book, but it's like tens of thousands of negative thoughts that enter <laughs> our mind every single day. Oh, yeah, I wrote that down. You, that was a fascinating quote or uh, stat here. 60,000 thoughts a day, 80% of which are negative. It's crazy. So, so oh, we're bombarded with 48,000 negative thoughts a day. There no one, like, it's, it's actually <laughs> yeah. no wonder Dayton happened, right? Right. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. so for me, it's like we have to, it's okay to have doubts, it's okay to have faith. But to hold on to those loosely. And sometimes we have to doubt our doubts. And sometimes we have to doubt our faith. Right, but I think you have to push harder. It's not just okay to have doubts. It's, a, it's not okay to not have doubts. Mm, yeah, man, <laughs> Sean is going to have like a million uh, tweetable answers here. All right, our next question is from Tabitha. My parents disapprove of my religion. I come from a, 
I come from a Baptist family and I desperately want my parents approval, but I'll never have it as a Buddhist. Any tips? <laughs> um, you have Buddhists at, at, uh, at your church. Um, we do. And um, I, if someone like and I'm accused all the time of being a Buddhist. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, if someone like Tabitha shows up and, and she asks you this question, you know, my parents disapprove of, of my religion or my way of living or, or, or whatever. What, what do you say to someone like her? Well, one, be grateful you have parents. Ah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I never knew my father. Yeah. And it was always a vacuum in my own life, wanting to know him just a little mm -hmm. bit. And, um, and, and I, I think one of the challenges in life is not to live your life for someone else's expectations. And I'm, I turned 61 uh, this next week, and, and when people asked me if there's something I could change, I said, yes, I would, I would worry less about the opinions of others about my own life. Mm -hmm. And you need to live a life of intention, not a life of obligation. Yeah. I yes, like indeed. That. I love yeah, that. we're often chained by our own obligations. Yeah, we we create these these obligations and then wear them like a like a dog collar or something, mm -hmm. and and realize like well, I put this collar on myself in the first place. Mm. Uh, my pithy answer is compromising our values to gain approval is a recipe for discontent. So uh, it sort of echoes what, what you're saying there. Like, yeah, if we're always like pinging around, like, what does this person think of me? What does this person, it's easy to do that because you get instant gratification, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, is, is in the moment feels good. Mm -hmm. But if we're just pinging around like a, like a ping pong ball or a pinball machine, we're never gonna be grounded and we're, we're not gonna feel contented by, by those actions, I think. Yeah, Tabitha, the only approval you need is your own and you know my I do not have the approval of my parents um, I desperately want it just like Tabitha does if I live the way my dad wanted me to it would be a very disingenuous life if I live the way my mom wanted me to it would be a very disingenuous life um, I have to look in the mirror and feel good about what I'm doing mm -hmm. and when we have relatives who don't support us it is very very difficult I don't want to undermine that but you're not you're going to live a happier life if you're fulfilling your own expectations rather than fulfilling other people's expectations. Ooh, you can tweet that too, Sean. <laughs> but I'll tell you what you just said, man, about um appreciating your dad. Like I've got I've got a really I got a lot of anger towards my dad that I've learned how to deal with. But what you just said about just appreciating having known him a little bit, you have no idea how much that like totally melted away some of that anger. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate that. Yeah, I, I, I'm in the same boat. Like, I, I never really knew my dad. I mean, he was around until I was about three. And so, like, what memories... The, the, right. the memories I do have are, like, of him and my mom fighting. And so, like, yeah, I don't have any real good memories. And then from there, he... he he, he took a, a bad turn, uh, was schizophrenic, and, and had a, a lot of issues. But... Um, I think about that now. Like, you know, my, my mother died when I was when I was 28. And, and that actually... I'm grateful... For for that in many ways because it started this whole minimalism journey it made me start to question what my life's focus was because i realized i was focused on the wrong stuff the sort of ephemeral pleasures the 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 status the trinkets the you know, the average american household has three hundred thousand items in it and i was trying to have more than that because <laughs> uh you know in order to be successful you need those trinkets now mm -hmm. Irwin, we, we have a bunch of more questions here surprise questions that podcast sean got together for us uh we're going to be answering some of these coming up do minimalism and religion walk hand in hand or are they completely different what are your thoughts on the commodification of religion in the united states how can i bond with my spouse when they've walked away from faith but i still believe how do i explain my choice to question my religion to loved ones mm. also we're going to talk about toxic versus healthy religion we're going to talk about diversity we're going to talk about grace we're going to talk about inner peace we're going to talk about the value of culture and so much more also i want to talk to erwin about um well uh, he recently had a battle with cancer that he won, and a lot of lessons were written about in The Way of the Warrior and also his previous book, uh, The Last Arrow. So I want to talk about that as well. And if you want to hear all that, you can listen to this week's Maximal episode, available exclusively on Patreon. That's right. You're currently listening to our weekly Minimal episode, but each week, Ryan and I record an entirely different, much, much longer Maximal episode on The Minimalist's private podcast, which gives us the private space we need to talk about a whole bunch of stuff we don't usually talk about in public. 
Uh, Ryan, this week was uh, we just finished it with with Erwin, and I can tell you that uh, we talked about a whole lot. I mean, it, it went yeah. long, it went in depth, it was it was really meaningful. You know, Senator, I was I was expecting to have a similar conversation with him, like we had with Rob Bell. Uh huh. It was two completely different conversations. Absolutely. Different. Yeah, it was great. In fact, we even talked a, a lot about Rob on there, and uh, we, we we talked about. Um, him being a heretic and how people you know question him. Anyway, I, I won't get into too much of it. We've already given you a preview there. Uh, just so you know, Patreon is the best way for us to fund this podcast and keep it 100% advertisement free. Also, when you subscribe to the Minimalist Private Podcast on Patreon, you'll receive a personal link so that it plays in your favorite podcast app. So whatever podcast app you're using to listen to this, you'll get a private link so that our regular private episodes will show up right next to our minimal episodes that you're listening to right now. You can find all the details and all the good stuff, including an additional private podcast episode every week over at theminimalists.com slash support. Also, just so you know, we're capping our Patreon audience over at uh, over there at 6,000 people. So get in there while you can. Ryan, what else you got for us? Being informed is more important than ever, so I want to encourage people to read more and get informed. And hey, you can do that by getting Irwin's book, The Way of the Warrior. I want to talk about uh, what I really loved about this book, man, is that this book I would recommend for anyone who feels like they have just gotten the snot beat out of them their whole life. And they're like... For anyone who has given up or is close to giving up, like that's who this book is for. Uh, when I read it, I, I was thinking about um, I was thinking about some some relatives, and I won't call them out specifically, but I'm certainly going to send this to a few relatives who I know are they're waiting for someone to come and, and save them. And I'm, I'm, that's not a, a hint towards Jesus; they're just anyone. And uh, what Irwin does is he really lays it out on how you can save yourself. And uh, you can still have faith and save yourself. So, yeah. yeah, check out that book. Get informed. It's it's a great book. And, oh, I also got some voicemail comments and tips from our listeners. Check them out. Hey, guys. My name is Jenny, and I'm calling from Sheboygan, Wisconsin. I wanted to share a tip and trick with minimalists that have a family. My husband and I recently became a family of three, welcomed our son Micah into the world six months ago. And adding another being to our lives can add a great deal of physical items and items that are outgrown really quickly. To honor our family's minimalism efforts and living within our one family income needs, we met um, and went to a family member who has a son one year older than our son Micah. We asked them if we could borrow their baby clothes and toys that they were storing in their basement and bins just in case they had another baby boy. So we thought that we could use them now rather than them just collecting dust in their basement. We have saved a great deal of time and money by borrowing these items. And in turn, we're storing them in our basement as the family has a smaller home and doesn't have space and they didn't want to pay to rent a space. We have even started buying bigger clothes and gifting them to the family member as they will become ours in the future when our son grows into that size. So we're creating this baby boy clothes, moving wardrobe, and getting the most out of each item by sharing them with multiple families. This could work with family members or friends, coworkers, or any listeners um, that need a tip. Uh, it's a win-win for everybody. Hi, guys. This is Virgo from Atlanta, Georgia. I just wanted to call, um, as a longtime barista, I have a couple tips about coffee. I know you guys are, are coffee people and own your own coffee shop, which is great, by the way. I love Bandit. Um, I just wanted to tell listeners that there's a really awesome coffee subscription service called tradecoffee.com. You can go in and put in your preferences and what kind of you know profiles you like. And um, you can put in you know what your brewing method is or whatever, and they will customize kind of, um, I guess, what coffee to send you and how often. You can tell them if you want it every week or every two weeks like I do or every month or however often you want to receive your bag of coffee. It's great roasted to order specialty coffee, and I have gotten a lot of value out of it. Um, every bag is between $18 and $22 usually. So it's um, it's about what you would pay at a specialty shop for a bag of coffee. And you can find new roasters to support, which is awesome. The other thing I wanted to share is um, TerraCycle.com, which is a service where you buy basically like a, a, a box and then you fill it with your used coffee bags and they will recycle them for you. And 
you know, anybody who drinks a lot of coffee knows, like, it sucks to throw away all those bags. Um, but, you know, what are you going to do with them, right? So you can recycle them with this service. It's a bit of an investment. Usually um, it's like $35 for a small pouch, or you can go bigger. I think the biggest option is like a pallet, which is $899 if you want to do that. But, yeah, um, it's just an option for recycling those bags. Um, thanks, guys. All right, y'all. Thanks again to Erwin McManus for joining us today. You can check him out at mosaic.org. That is is his organization on the Maximal episode. We also talked about their Here to Stay campaign. If you want to learn more about that, it's mosaic.org slash here to stay. You can check out his book, The Way of the Warrior, and all of his other books as well at erwinmcmanus.com. You can also follow him on social media at Erwin McManus. And real quick, for right here, right now, here's one thing that's going on in the life of the minimalist. I think this is probably the last time we're going to talk about this because we are so close. Hmm. Now, Ryan, it has been a difficult year for our hometown, yeah. Dayton, Ohio. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a tornado. Yeah. Uh, beginning of the summer. Yeah. Actually, 14 tornadoes to be specific mm. all across Dayton. Uh, just so much devastation across Dayton. And then a few months later, a mass shooting two blocks from the last house I lived in in Dayton. In fact, the first house I grew up in, uh, just two blocks away. Mm. And um, mass shooting, nine people murdered. And 27 people were were uh, were injured, and uh, it's just been a rough year for Dayton. And they have all kinds of other problems as well: the opioid epidemic, and another big problem that we're trying to help solve. And that is the fact that one of the largest food deserts in the country is in Dayton, Ohio, the west side of Dayton, where roughly 40 percent of the residents of Dayton live does not have a single grocery store. And mm-hmm. we're trying to change that. Uh, we've raised ninety six thousand dollars right now. Oh man, we're four thousand dollars away from having the final hundred thousand dollars to build this grocery store with the folks at the Gym City Market. Now, this is a not for profit co op. This isn't your traditional, you know, Kroger or or whatever. This is a a grocery store that is going to focus on providing healthy food to the community, but also. Food, healthy food education to the community, which is equally important. If you want to contribute to that, it's really simple. A dollar, ten dollars, twenty dollars, a million dollars. <laughs> but really, we only need four thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. Uh, four thousand dollars, <laughs> whatever you want to contribute. Uh, Ryan and I have contributed twenty five thousand dollars of our own money as well. You can go to the minimalists.com slash Dayton. You can see the little thermometer there. We are so, so close and we need your help to get the little last bit to uh, build this grocery store and you can follow us on social media to keep up to date on the progress as well if you have a question comment or minimalism tip for our podcast leave us a voicemail 406-219-7839 or send a voice memo to podcast at the minimalists.com you can comment on this episode at youtube.com slash the minimalists if you want our show notes in your inbox sign up for our email list over at the minimalists.com and you'll also receive our simple sunday emails for our added value this week i thought it'd be appropriate since since Erwin was here, his daughter, her name's Mariah. Her stage name is Raya. She's a super talented musician. I just started listening to her her new project this week. It, the project itself is called uh, Heartbreak Magic, but she has this great song called In My Dreams. Now, Ryan, you and I are fans of Andrew Bell and uh, like Amy Stroop, mm-hmm. and her music reminds me a lot. It's in that same vein. Mm. It's really good. I can't wait to check it out. Yeah, so let's, uh, let's, let's finish this episode today. Let's listen to In My Dreams from Raya's new EP, Heartbreak Magic. And if you leave here today with just one message, we hope it's this. Love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. The Minimalists.